Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. We're here. Release of Hivestorm, you know, big big weekend for everybody. How many games deep are we all? Uh, I've done a couple. I'm like, you know, 10 games deep, I think, at this point. Scattered across random teams and different settings and different levels of competition. What about you, John? I've done, I've done a few games. <laughs> you got the the shade wall up on YouTube for anyone who has oh, never heard of this. You know, dropping the new portable barricade with models that ignore piercing. Very potent. You know, we've got the three up save from the shade strain on the Vespid Stingwing. So now it's a two up save that ignores piercing and just like can't be shot within six. And if you're you are within six, it's got a effectively an invuln save. You can do something similar with stuff like Boy Dancer Troop 2, which is pretty cute. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that got FAQ'd to be limited to not better than 3-up. But yeah, we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised. But, I mean, a Death Jester sitting on a vantage point with a portable barricade, nailing people with shots, is pretty solid. Can you get up there? I don't think you can climb with um, the barricades. And you have to well, deploy it on the floor, right? Or nah? Yes. You have to yeah, deploy it on the floor. I guess it is on the floor. Well. The real question is whether or not Vespid, who teleport, can actually teleport with a barricade and replace it after they move. Of that, I don't think the wording quite lets you do it, but it also, it is, I would say it's probably up to your local TO, because I think the wording is pretty tight on it being possible, maybe, but also we're not 100% sure. So, like, the can... ability to move with the barricade is an action that is linked to the item itself. So I'm assuming if you do another action to move, like teleporting... I'm assuming it doesn't work because you're not using the universal action of move with barricade. That's my assumption. I, from what I remember, it was that every time Vespid move or reposition, they can teleport instead and they can be placed somewhere else. And whether or not that allows on the the barricades for you to move it to the next position with it. Because that's I, just I, like I remember looking at this right? for like an hour trying to narrow down whether I could or could not do it. And I don't think I came away with a distinct decision when i was staring at it yeah i guess like vespid there's a little bit more wiggle room there whereas like um if you're teleporting with corsairs or uh warp coven or something that's like definitely an action that is not move yes so move with barricade is the same as a reposition action except you know you the barricade disappears as you're moving and then reappears next to your model after you're done moving and then Vespid are you pick up the model anytime you would move and you place it back down somewhere else at the end of the move. So I think it is possible. You probably should check with your local TO. It definitely is pretty cheesy, but it's probably not the cheesiest thing of this edition with the current discourse around barbed wires and in the dark and barricades and all the other stuff. So there's been a couple of new things in the edition that we've had to make some calls on. What have you guys thought about the chicanery of blocking up in the dark? with new faction player place terrain. Well, I think the biggest issue is how um, it's like a spiraling topic of how so many players are trying to reinterpret the rules. I had a, a discussion yesterday with my local community Ooh. where certain members were like, because it always says rounded up for splitting your groups on approved ops, it now means I can deploy in 442 for my 10 operative team because I always round up, even though it's never worked that way before. And they were like, no, it works that way because it specifically says round up. So I was like, Games Workshop said specifically jump off a cliff, you would. And they were like, no, that's completely different. And it's just like, it's, 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 there's so many weird interactions. People like, to be fair, the, the clear way razor wire is supposed to work is it's anytime you move through it, it's minus two movement. But then technically, you can't just move through stuff because they forgot to give it that rule. So you technically should climb it. I personally think razor wire is fine within access points because usually blocking off access points that's what it's there for i just don't think it should be climbable in terms of you shouldn't pay four inches 
I think there's a couple weird like niche cases around how you can set barricades up just like in the first release of In the Dark where you could get a hallway and you could place a barricade like just far enough where you could set a model just close enough where you literally couldn't be charged. It's basically one of those situations again where five inch model moves just literally cannot walk through anything if you place something that's climbable in front of a window as long as you leave like just under an inch gap so there's just nowhere to place your models. So I think it's really the core issue because we can't append a dash action with our reposition actions anymore. Yeah, I, I want to talk about like not being able to combine dash with climbs. That's actually really hindered my games in general. It's like it's made moving around really difficult. So apparently this is intentional, but it just slows down stuff. And it feels like the only reason it was added is because someone was sick of telling people they can't dash over barricades. But it, it genuinely slows down the game because I always thought, oh, I can just dash up a ladder. That's what I can do. But dashing specifically doesn't work with climbing. So yeah, you even, can drop. That's it. Well, even when I was playing Beta Decima, because you now can't combine your reposition and dash, I couldn't jump some of the platforms because uh, the way you move and repos well, reposition and dash now with the Beta Decima platforms, because some of them are like just within three inches because you can do a four inch jump. You can't actually jump those. So you end up just stuck, stuck in the open, which... I know they've done it on purpose, but it feels really bad. It just doesn't feel right. Yeah. Have you had this come up so far, Jason? Um, you know, no one here is really trying to do anything crazy with equipment. We're all just trying to, I don't know, learn the teams. Uh, starting off with simple, like normal people, I guess. Uh, but I mean, like, yeah. we need we need the uh, yeah. the crazy rules people like you to find and break these things so that they can be fixed. Yeah, I think the first edition launch, like the last edition launch of Kill Team right now, for anyone who's listening, who's like, oh, man, barbed wire is so annoying and all this other crazy stuff is like, why didn't they think of these things? Like, you know, this happened with the last edition of Kill Team 2. It took a little bit of growing pains for GW to get a grip on what people were trying to break. And, you know, by the end of the edition, we got it. We got to a pretty good space. And I think already in this edition, we're starting off with better wordings for a lot of things, maybe not everything, you know, stuff like the Psychomancer's weird madness ability, getting a weird call out and maybe not fading off at the right time. Those are all things that they'll probably fix reasonably quick, whether that's, you know, within a month or within three months or maybe right before the world championships. That's always going to be a harder question. <laughs> Well, it's it's the the stuff I'm annoyed at is stuff that was clearly established last edition that they've just forgotten, like how every pistolier can triple shoot as long as they fire a normal weapon first. That's just like I understand the other stuff, like the new stuff, like the razor wire, some of the equipment, new rules having weird interactions. But literally, when you spent an edition establishing how these double pistol action works, and then un unintentionally realizing until it goes live. After it's like been actually play tested thoroughly, that everyone's just completely wrong. So, because currently on the wording for all the unique pistol actions, it says you can make a free pe uh, shooting action irregardless of other rules, which basically means you can just shoot. I think the Inquisition one's worse because it says it's only restrictions you can't do while you have a conceal order. So, technically, can shoot while in control range because uh, the wording's all messed up on that, which I just find crazy but like, it's, it's just that's the weird thing. i mean and like also they intentionally gave some pistoliers the ability to shoot within control range so i mean it, it would be weird to do it in this like stealth way that seems unintentional but if it was like intentional and then they're like you can shoot within control range and this is like i don't know yeah this actually brings up a really nice point for the new edition on how us as TOs and kind of like community leads kind of work around some of these things where we all thought that we kind of understood what GW wanted, but now we're seeing, you know, a new set of rules where everybody got rewrites and triple shooting was definitely a thing that we never allowed to begin with because it's hard for Space Marines to be able to pull the trigger twice. God forbid some random mook with an APL buff pulls a trigger thrice. It's not really a thing that we were really expecting. So you guys using any of the old guiding principles in some of your rulings or, you know, how are you guys dealing with triple shoot? John, I assume you're just not allowing it if you're going to run a no, tournament. I'm no, I'm not. I've had people argue with me that it's the intention. Games Workshop intended these operatives to triple shoot because it was a fair way to make these teams strong, such as with Corsairs. Like it's rare, rare Corsairs really needed to move and reposition dash, fire their melter pistol, then fire their melter pistol and shuriken pistol again. Uh, I haven't been allowed it, but I've also been going off of um, the last edition FAQs, for example, like the pillars, 
for being within cover for Galodark because people are like, I can now be within cover of the walls. I can run along the wall and I'm I'm safe. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. Okay, we've already got like uh, anything that's related to like general sequencing and stuff until it... I don't think we've had any crazy interactions with the new teams, but anything I can interpret from the old FAQs that made sense, I've carried over. Um, and it's, it's just trying to get people to agree unless they've gone insane. It's like, no, we must play all rules as written, everything, like... A thing I found out today, technically, if Inquisitor agents take uh, exaction squads, because of the wording and how they change it, because they get allowed the repression rule and being able to shoot into combat, because that rule gets replaced in all instances of Inquisitor agents, it technically applies to every Inquisitor agent operative. So if Inquisitor agents take exaction squads, all Inquisitor agents can shoot into control range because of how the wording works. And I'm like, I know that's not intentional. But technically, they're right. So it's very difficult to argue with some things. Yeah, I mean, it goes... Ruthless efficiency is a thing unless you shoot into melee range. It says, whenever a friendly Inquisition agent operative is shooting and you're selecting a valid target, you can use this rule. If you do, having other friendly Inquisition agent operatives within an enemy yeah. operative's control range doesn't prevent that enemy operative from being selected. Because it doesn't quite localize it to the operative that is spreading out the aura it's just like a flat thing that everybody gets yeah so is definitely there's definitely some growing pains that we're gonna have to work through i think the idea is that the exaction squad operatives if they're holding on to a dude in melee or someone else is shooting into them you could do it but what they actually well, mean here it's kind of hard to know well because it worked last edition it was just like the the exaction squad benefited from their own when they were taking an exaction squad so i've gone with that intention but some people are like i know but they specifically worded that way and it's like it's clearly a really bad copy paste job so. yeah i think i'm kind of on you know personally you know on this specific point i'm probably okay with just letting inquisition agent shoots into exaction squads like you know it's fine what's the worst that could happen the wording is very specific and you can if they want to fix it they'll fix it it's also not that big of a buff. Like, Exaction Squad is a five-man pile that's decent, but it's not going to break the game. So, like... Uh, it's, it's the, it, it just allows any Inquisitor agent to shoot into control range, which includes the multi-motor. Do they have to be but within a certain range to do it? Nope. They do there's not no range anymore. restriction now. Big, that was there's a big no update range to restriction now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's intentional. Games Workshop intended for all of this to happen. The there's definitely going to just be... runs up with a beacon and then it just like puts it <laughs> on the dude's forehead and then he's just like, shoot him, bro. And then he shoots straight yeah. through him and then he's like, friendly fire's not on, bro. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> or it's like he shoots and like you shoot the plasma blast into combat and then the guy's just like, oh, it was me. I was the target. <laughs> there's an exaction dude just. Turns out he was, a, he was a runaway heretic that the Inquisition was hunting the whole time. And then they just, like, put him on a leash and they're like, run into the enemies and we'll give you a quick death. <laughs> and then his skull is turned into a servo skull for his service. Exactly. Yeah, there's definitely... This is, like, the fun part of a new edition, right? We And because we're doing an interface where we're bleeding over from the last edition and pushing over the 33 teams, you know, pour one out for the compendium homies, there's going to be weird cases. And it's... I think, you know, there's different ways about doing it using what worked in the old edition and trying to carry forward that spirit i think makes sense for most cases but i've always been a big fan of like let's just play it the way it's written and they can learn to write better rules and you know that's that's where that's been my guiding light the whole time because i know there are certain regions that have wanted to move barbed wire back two inches from access points to basically just ignore the issue of like what happens if you try to phase through barbed wire and i'm a big proponent of feel like we were supposed to be able to make access points annoying to get through. You know, they already cost an inch to move through. Now you got to climb over afterwards, too, which means that there's a bunch of other weird cases. So, you know, maybe we just let the doors be annoying and you can take a dash action at the end of your your reposition so that you can get directly into the open. No, not move anywhere else and then die. So um, we you kind of touched on this, but just to clarify, with the barbed wire, um, you have to climb it, or that's like up is that's like up for debate. So, 
the big thing on all terrain is if you want to climb over something or get over terrain, we no longer have the traverse rule. So one of the big changes of this edition is that instead of having a rule that lets you pay two inches of movement to ignore that piece of terrain, now you have to physically climb over all pieces of terrain and any anything that you want to get over. And all climbs are a minimum of two inches. So that means barricades, heavy barricades, portable barricades, barbed wire are all things that need to be interacted with if you want to get her over them. And when they are now in front of accessible points, that means that you're going to have to pay two inches to climb the barricade or the barbed wire, another two inches as you cross the barbed wire, and then one inch for you to go through the accessible point, which means that if you give just a little less than one inch of space between you and a door, it is impossible for anyone to finish a reposition action in a legal position because you're by necessity always going to be stuck in midair floating over the barbed wire in the middle of crossing it so if they wanted us to be able to block doors off like that then we need to be able to add a dash or you just literally cannot walk through a door unless you have seven inches of movement or you can teleport like higher attack uh amusingly it does go both ways so if you have tools to get over it and your opponent does not you can set up a little one-way mirror to project threats through yeah, and I think it's like a very narrow subset of models, which are all the Phobos models and all of the elf teams that have seven inches of movement can use and this. Legionary. It's not and Legionary, yeah. Anyone who can get to seven inches of movement. So there's actually a fair number of teams that can actually get through these situations. But if you are metagaming it, basically any team with a five inch movement just can't interact with this. I, I think I can't escape through the door. Or, just yeah, trapped. or I think my expectation for the New York Open you know, for anyone who's listening, who's coming to the tournament, I'm going to put it in a mission packet anyways, is that when you're interacting with player place terrain and you're trying to and you get stuck, you can finish with a dash. And that at least gets us to the position of now you can move through the door and jump into a room. There's not going to be anything on the other side of the room. So it's going to suck anyways. But it does kind of seem like they want it to suck. So I'll let it suck. What about you, Jason? How do you feel like you're going to rule stuff like this for the new edition in the Minnesota area? Um... I mean, it's it's tough. I haven't thought about it that much before this podcast. Um, I mean, I guess I would also a huge factor would be to see how the players are going to push for it and hear everyone's opinions locally. Because, um, you know, I, I don't want to just like make a decision that people 100 percent don't agree with. Um, but, you know, I think ultimately by the time the Minnesota people catch on on how to to break it and like because we don't do like a lot of tournaments um you know by the time it would be a problem it would be fixed now hear me out do this in a joint ops mission and show your, <laughs> your team the easy way to play call of duty zombies there you go what about you john well it's like a lot of this would be alleviated if they allowed dashing with climbing as i've talked about before i do think razor wire if you don't i think razor wire the way it's supposed to work as i was told uh is like when you move through it, you're supposed to be able to pass through it, but just cost two inches from your movement. And I think it's if it works like that, it's fine to be within access points because then it's just three inches. It shouldn't uh, barricade shouldn't be there because gar- barricades are more problematic. But I think razor wire working in that scenario is fine. But personally, I would rule it in my own unique way and say like, look, I I love stopping uh, leads at like halfkin and hankin by putting up the baby the baby wall. Like, you know, you know, the, the, the trap them, you're not allowed to leave this. You don't have the baby lock. Um, but it does feel incredibly unfair. I think there's scenarios where not even like a 40 or 50 mil base can actually even attempt to clear the razor wire at the moment. Yeah. So honestly, if it's just like if you barely don't make it, you can still place on the other side, but you just have to like touch the razor wire on the other side. Could be a good way I'm to I'm surprised it. I didn't do something where it's like. You uh, give it a new rule and just take, like, you take 2d3 damage moving through or something. Or, like, d3 plus 1. Something like it hurts you instead of slowing. Like, something like that. It's... I I am... (laughs) It's just strange this completely, like, didn't get caught until it went public. So Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a case of the most competitive players basically looking at something like, how... How can we break this? And, you know, there's always... There's always going to be stuff that's broken, right? You know, one of the big talking points right now is something that me and John had, you know, at the beginning of the last edition when there was a small change to adding cover words to vantage points. We had 
there's like a two day long internet discussion about how it would break the game. And we've circled all the way back around and GW has deigned vantage points as cover. I feel like they were gaslighting us. But I do actually think it's a big problem more on the Vulcus maps because some of those vantage points, those are the tallest vantage point. If you could place a second model on there, I think it would be fine. But the problem I'm having with these vantages giving, conce- like being cover, is when you've got a vantage point higher than another, which is a problematic thing with Vulcus. So I'm very tempted for Vulcus to uh, rule at my events. You can't go on the second level because it, it literally is, if you get up there and you can abuse it, like the if you can get the Angels of Death Eliminator up there, your opponent is just screwed. There's nothing they can do. That operative is now safe forever deleting people. But like, how long and... is it going to take them to get up there? Oh, you can get up in there, single activation. You put a ladder up there. So you reposition to get within range. Then you climb the first one three inches. And then if you put the ladder right, you can do a one inch climb and get up to the top. Yeah, you you can get up there in one turn. It's not that crazy. I think the real question is whether or not it actually is going to do that much more than if it were just a normal intercessor that could shoot from up there. Like, it is annoying, for sure. Like, having a completely silent operative sitting on the second-story vantage that can't be charged and can't be shot is certainly really gross. But the counterplay is you know where he's going to be coming from. If he's standing up there, he's not going to be scoring objectives. Generally, the second-story vantage is kind of far away from some of the objectives. You know, a lot of the maps dead spaces that you can hide from him. Yeah, so, like, it is is incredibly worse. But yeah, then he, he can't double shoot if he does that. Correct. Well, you can double shoot, then spend a CP to counteract while on conceal to give himself ignore obscure, and then he can shoot again. That's true. true. There's a lot of different. There's a lot of crazy things you can do, but whether or not that is going to be the best use of one of your six operatives in the games, that probably is a, a matchup thing. Obviously, silent weapons are really powerful on vantage, double vantage. You know, especially because when you're shooting an engage operative in the new edition of Kill Team, you get accurate too. So you just aren't rolling dice half the time. You're just chucking pe- chucking dice at people. So there's definitely going to be some growing pains. Yeah, I mean, honestly, with the like the it does sound like a crazy combo, but if I can get a shot on someone with an intercessor warrior on turn one instead of like using an equipment option of a ladder and the sniper to get up there and then shoot later on in the game, um, I would rather just push into territory with another warrior and just go nuts and and i uh, i feel like they both are fully valid in different ways and for that reason i'm not super upset about the turbo sniper nest well it's like i think if we still had indirect grenades even though i hate indirect grenades i think it would be fine because you have some counterplay but the problem is especially if these snipers can also like take infiltration and they can deploy aggressively and actually steal up there and just start going sniper and then doing um uh, what do you call it uh the infiltration model they just max by just looking at you well um, for you to yeah, do I'm implant and shoot, surveillance it's yeah surveillance, surveillance go. you got to be in your opponent's side and then you can do it so it's not if you got to cross halfway through the board to get into the second story vantage and your opponent like sees it coming and doesn't do anything i think it, you know fair enough fair game is your opponent somehow managed to chuck their eliminator into a good spot. Obviously, the big minus here is the Commando Grot can do it, and everybody hates the Commando Grot <laughs> in this situation. So, if you ever see a second story Volcus on a map, and you're playing against Commandos, and you get a chance to select the board side, make sure that the Commandos keep the second story vantage in their deployment zone, and not yours. Because you do not want a Grot sitting on top of the second story floor, casting surveillance and just gaining nine points <laughs> or like if they do uh rush up there first i don't know yeah. or hit it's like a different sink. layers of counterplay everyone knows that that second floor is really important so make sure that when you're playing against a team with some of these tricks you guys are paying attention and if you guys have had any stories about silent terror nests sitting on there you know come onto our discord come onto our youtube chat and let us know because we'd be down to hear some stories some horror stories so maybe we can inform our decisions right absolutely on the list of silent weapons you know how are we feeling about the changes to silent in general i think it's kind of cute that pathfinders while they might not be generically good this edition are one of the few teams that actually got to keep mass silent weapons right up there with hunter clade who can support five silent weapons with 
With ceaseless. Wait, Hunter Clade can do five silent weapons? Flechette blasters are fully silent pistols that just uh, oh, nail oh, them, man. nail you with two two profiles. And That's the leader princess with Hunter Clade can actually get super conceal within three inches for all infiltrators. So you could have a couple of them sitting in a building just like nailing you <laughs> with and those two are, two silent weapons. Pistols? Which is very, so they're they are pistols, yeah. Still pretty good. Uh, I don't know. That's that's wow. That's kind of cute. Hadn't seen that or heard that at all. Yep, it's a uh, five attacks on threes, two two range eight, saturate silent forever because they're flechettes. So they're using like little pistols, and then the canticle of shroud psalm from the Sicarian infiltrator princeps gives you permanent conceal. So you could just have a couple of them hanging out, being bros, just nailing people with silent weaponry. And then if you charge them because you don't like them anymore, they can turn off rerolls and uh, hit you with a power sword. Pour one out for those who built taser goads because those still suck. Sounds like the answer there is just run up and shoot them within two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are the highlights for, you know, now that we've got all the rules and, you know, what are the highlights net with a little bit of t- time to digest outside of, you know, the obvious ones like Astartes, you know, Legionaries being good. You know, all of us, I think, have talked about Legionary Warriors being cool. But any other standouts for cool rewrites or other things that you're excited to play? I, I really like Legionary. That's, that's yeah, so nice. honestly, the rant go off. Uh, look, I've I've ranted a lot about Inquisition Inquisition players. They not, not the players, their team to the point where like they they're like you you never said there's any problems with the other team. So I was like I did dedicated videos to it. It it's it, like for me the thing that annoys me about Inquisition is uh, they're repeating mistakes that got them broken. Uh, but I think the standout stuff for me, um, I actually. Generally, I'm shocked by how nice the White Dwarf teams are. Before, they used to be really difficult to play. Now, they're still expensive to buy into, but actually fairly good to play. Especially Warp Coven, who, even though they're still a bit annoying, got supercharged. So Yeah, the Warp Coven got a huge glow up. I know me and Jason mentioned in our little Warrior Roundup tier list that the rubrics are pretty good now, you know, hitting on or saving on two ceaseless hitting on threes effectively three five bolt guns with piercing one means that they're just going to reliably murder a lot of things yeah out of the three of the three white dwarf teams oh actually no there's four right Wormblade, void dancer hunter clade and warp coven all of them got pretty big glow ups i think you know Wormblade are now a version of the tempesta scions with the same with a very similar vibe of if not all the dudes pop out of the tunnels in time, the tunnels collapse and you just lose a couple guys. And the Void Dancer troop, I know, John, you used to play Void Dancer troop. Any any thoughts on uh, the new troop? I'm not allowed to talk about Void Dancer troop. The community haven't forgiven me ever since I deleted Fly. I, I rolled up to Nottingham and I was like, Elliot, it's time. Remove Fly. Ignore all my Void Dancer troop wins and collection. They're, this team must be killed. And then I did it. And thus, I am never allowed to talk about Void Dancer Troop again. Otherwise, uh, I had playtesters play play apologizing to me. They're like, like, John, I don't know what happened, but I don't know why you're being targeted as the as the Void Dancer Troop killer. But thank you. It's just like, great. You know, at least the Harlequin's Panoply is now a little bit better. So at the end of the edition, Grav Belts went from fly to a two inch you know penalty so now everything just costs you two inches now it's basically everything has permanent ladders which is pretty sweet actually especially with the new change to all the different times of terrain that we have access to the the only weird thing is they drop normally but they jump they're not good at they can't land they're just bad at landing they're really bad at very high jumps so if you're jumping from the top of Volcus, i think it's like a six inch drop and then that's a little spooky for a harlequin (laughs) but on the way up they're totally fine you know Grabbing all the gantries and stuff, but on the way down, there's no fight in gravity. That's true. That checks out. Um, Have you taken a look at them, Jason? Uh, I, I looked at them a little bit. Um, like the Sadaf stuff is super streamlined, which is excellent. Um, I actually do have the Void Dancer team uh, in my collection, and I played them a little bit, but I haven't played them a lot. And so I, t- I took a peek at them. Um, yeah, I mean they're 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 streamlined. They're cleaned up. They're very very similar to how they were. And uh, I don't know. I probably like uh, there's so many teams I'm excited about to play before them that they are nowhere on my going to play them soon list. So what is on your soon to play list then, Jason? So I've actually been planning. I think I'm just going to play a super simple Angels of Death 
for New York Open. And when it comes to the question of do you bring the heavy intercessor or the eliminator, my answer is neither. <laughs> Just looking for that mobility and that clean double fight, double shoot, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. So I'm like 14 wounds on everyone and six inches of movement on everyone. Fantastic. Uh, then there's like, there's no, there's no, like, nothing stands out as like, look here. You just have this completely uniform threat that you can project evenly from anywhere. It's beautiful. And then, you know, you don't, you're not interested in taking the Eliminator Sniper and having him run around with a bolt pistol to tap twice. And every once in a while you pull out the, the big sniper rifle in a safe position. It's kind of neat, and like the seven inches is kind of cool, um, but I don't know. Uh, just like the the regular intercessors are super cool. Um, I ordered a box of Sword Brethren Black Templars that I'm going to turn into assault intercessors, and I just think that's going to be cool and fun hobby hobby project. Um, and nice. now that assault intercessors can double shoot, um, I haven't really like noodled around with it a lot, but it smells like there's going to be something there. Yeah, I mean, with the power of the sharpshooter chapter tactic, where when you stand still, you get severe, you're basically guaranteed in a good firing position with your new 8-inch pistols for your heavy bolt pistols to just be 4 attacks on 3s, 3-4, pierce 1 with a retained to crit. And, like, um, one of the ideas that I had was playing all Assault Intercessors with Hardy, so you crit save on 5s, and Duelist, so you can double parry. Also, it says once per turning point, and then there's two bullet points. So it's not like once per turning point, you do it's once per one of those. Yeah, once per sequence. Um, it's You could do each... It looks like you could do each of those bullet points once per sequence. So you could use a crit to parry two normals, or a normal to parry a crit. Well, not or, and... Um, so that actually is kind of like, if you read it that way and that actually stands, it is even better than it looks. Yeah, we're going to have to find a whole new generation of reading in between the lines from things that GW said once the first set of erratas and day one patches come out and <laughs> what we have right now. Because I really don't want to have another Votan situation where we are guessing what they're going to do with the plasma beamer and then the ruling comes out and none of the none of the expectations come true because i know i've i mentioned this before in the past with the plasma beamer for the votan started off with where everyone is expecting the original target basically just gets deleted 100 percent of the time with crits because the plasma beamer used to do extra damage to everything in a line everyone was trying to figure out if it was before the main target or after the main target or everyone on the line and the main target and then the errata came out i think like a month later and it was the main target never gets hit and it's just everybody on the line we're like oh well no one no one had this fourth position on the internet it was so we're gonna have to it's gonna take us a little bit gw is gonna answer once or twice and then we're gonna have to start kind of collating what we actually think they mean for some of these kind of fuzzy areas well like the interesting thing i don't know if boons are per tournament or per game like how does that work do you pick your boons for warp coven oh warp coven game? it's like when you select your operative you get to select your boon i'm almost 100 percent sure on that one yeah, I'm pretty sure I it's per game. For chapter tactics and they'll, it's just whenever you select a sorcerer for the battle, you must select a boon. There is no okay. roster situation, so when you're playing Warp Coven, make sure to keep a heads your head on a swivel because now you've got ten choices for boons and you're not fixed to them. So you know, in some games, you're gonna be able to cast a uh, mind blast, mind burn, and then add devastating to it, so it just does one two damage and permanently injure someone. Some other games, you're gonna want those extra mission mission actions other games you're gonna to want to have fly so it's gonna be very powerful as a warp coven player to have a bigger toolbox that's more flexible and of course a doom bolt that just deletes basically anything with eight wounds or under real quick y'all ratlings or tank busters what do you think i'm honestly i'm kind of excited for both but i feel like the orcs the orc orcoid take on an Astartes tier team sounds very amusing, especially if I assume that the two bomb squigs pictured in all of these images are just going to be like the commando bomb squigs, where they are fully extra operatives that don't count for the kill grade. So you're basically playing Space Marines with two bombs that just blow up and hit people for, I assume, a very similar profile to the commando's bomb squig, which sounds really rude because six dice on fours, four five damage is not fun to play against. And I'm assuming those orcs are going to be even killier and easier to kill. 
Because, I mean, like, if you look at those hammers, I'm I'm assuming it's going to be, like, five attacks on three, five, five brutal or something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't Maybe think, even crazy. They have them save. They might not. I suspect they won't save on threes. But if they saved on fours and they had more wounds than the average of starties, like they were basically like the heavy intercessor style chassis on a four up save with eighteen wounds, and they could all fight and shoot and have three APL. That does sound very appealing on a just I just want to crump them level. And considering that commandos were basically one of the most popular teams for the entirety of Kill Team 21 or Kill Team 2.0, I'm pretty excited. They look cool and being able to send some guys to explode, especially if you catch a dog in the blast blast range, sounds just kind of fun. And the story I think for the box is a very compelling story to me of everybody else left to defend the gun and the people left behind to defend were the ratlings and the dogs. And then suddenly the the orcs from the comet show up to to bust bust down the gun. Oh, the moon, because they blew up the moon. That's right, right. The moon was exploded by the gun at some point. And then yeah. the orcs uh- orcs infest the moon. It's just like good 40k lore. And then having the ratlings get left behind, even funnier. Uh, so for me, um, so the, I think the the good way it was phrased to me is the the tank busters are Xenos elite because there's eight operatives. But I still think the knob is going to be 14 moons for up save. They're going to have like breach armor effectively because they're tank busters. So they're, they'll be immune to their own devastating, two inch devastating whatever. Uh, but I don't think they're going to be that good. They're going to hit hard. They're going to be okay. It's the ratlings who are going to be cracked. Because the, as I said in my video, yeah, yeah, because yeah, in these in these new season, in this like ever since third edition, teams are either okay or absolutely broken. There's been no in between. I think we were kind of lucky with Hive Storm. I am now expecting the the tank busters to be fine. Like they're going to be very fun, quite interesting. I'd be really hoping they get plus one to hit against operatives with sixteen or more wounds, or even like fourteen or more, because you know that they. Sh- yeah, they shoot big ones. But the Ratlings are going to be absolutely cracked. They can take Ogrins. Uh, so you probably take three Bulgrins, and each Bulgrin takes the place of two Ratlings. So you could probably have like four Bulgrins, uh, six Bulgrins, and then like four Ratlings. The Ratlings are all going to have Super Conceal. They have an anti tank rifle that will probably just delete people every time they shoot. They have a Trapper. They have a Frenchy. Like they, they have Super Conceal. If you charge them, they fall back. Like, you know, that kind of stuff. And then you're going to have like the Bulgrins just sitting on the point with their slab shields, probably have four up save, 16 wounds, like double parry. Like they're going to be an absolutely broken team. That's what I am. That's what I'm going with. That's my bets. Uh, gotta, we're going to be like ruined the day after this box drops. Like, damn, Ratlings are like top of the meta. It's ridiculous. These, li- these little short guys, they can't see us, but we can't catch them. And then we're just getting beaten up by their Bulgrins. The new short yeah, for kings. anyone. For anyone who hasn't looked at the rules, the Scarper rule for the for the Ratlings means that they kind of all have the Mandrake's ability to dash at the end of your movement, and that's just baked into the data sheets. And I'm kind of expecting that because they're smaller ab humans, they're probably not going to even hit the seven wound mark that humans normally do. So they might get stuck at like five or six wounds, and that could be really interesting. Five or six wounds with the super conceals. The option to go elite, big warp coven vibes. Assuming that's well, what I, it is. I think you can have the meme build where everyone has a sniper rifle. Ten yeah, sniper it's, rifles, bro. It's, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really interesting bug. I suspect <laughs> it'll be somewhere in the January, February range, considering that they need to give this about three months to breathe for Hive Storm. Who knows though, because they dropped this on the Hive Storm release day, which I was not expecting. What are yeah, you I excited thought- for, Jason, between these two teams? Uh definitely the the orcs. I mean, just run out there and smash them sign me up yeah where you get tanked up so as long as you do a fight or shoot action you get to act as a three apl model you'll know if it lets you double fight or double shoot that might be trapped in the realm of the more graceful and the more genetically super soldiered so we'll have to see if that if that is allowed if they can't it'll break my heart but also if they're just like good enough to just kill whatever they fight anyways I don't know, man. There's not a, there's not enough dice to even out. But they look cool. Yeah, the models for this box do look kind of hype. And I really like the terrain, too. Just the add-on to Volcus looks good. The bomber model for the Ratlings, who's got, you know, cybernetics. Some of my favorite stuff in all of sci-fi. Just 
give me a robot arm that you can tell me works just as good as my real arm. Any highlights for you from the model range, John? Uh, so, I, while I do like the rat leans, the, my problem is they're too much like a comedy range. They remind me of the half leans from Blood Bowl. The half leans were balanced and they were like played as a com- comedic joke up front. Uh, the tank busters look great. They look really, like, really thematic and they fit the lore. The only thing I miss is that um, the tank buster knob before had like a trench coat from a tank commander he killed and blew up because he blew up his tank. It doesn't have that anymore, but they'll probably work that way in. Um, I don't think they'll be able to double fight and double shoot because uh, it was great. I played the commandos today and he's like, okay, I'm going to charge and fight. And I've got free APO. Oh, I can't fight again. And it's like, yep, yeah. can't do that. So, but he does have a boss pole. So he's probably going to have something related to, he probably can boss people around as well or something. He's um, also, he's also got a rocket pistol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, rocket pistol. Yeah. Uh, the crazy thing is if they make the bomb squeaks GA2. Or he's only get like can you you can survive one bob squeak can you survive a second? I will say the the payout or the loadouts on these bomb squeaks look a little bit lower than the commando bomb squeak, so they might not have six dice. They have seven because so, one has a rocket. So. The blessed number. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an interesting model range. Any highlights for you, Jason? Um. Yeah, I mean, they definitely do all look cool. Um, I'm definitely planning to put a little extra time and love. Uh, I mean, like, I have an old orc war boss, and, like, I put all sorts of extra junk on him. Um, he was, like, my greenskins leader. Um, and I, like, he, his big choppa, I put rocket bayonets on him. Um, I gave him a wrist-mounted flamethrower. Um, I don't know, man. I'm ready just for all the ridiculous, just, like... I want to see if he has multiple profiles and then build them out just to be, to be the new Daka Dad. Oh, I did hear that apparently you can build all the operatives. Um, like, you can either build everyone with rockets, some with tank hammers, maybe some with the... Uh, I, I really like Double Fisto, um, the one who's just going to punch people uh, off points and stuff. The Crusher. He, he double fists. He does the double fisting. But um, I would be... I think that's going to be a two box te- uh, kill team because if you can suddenly go like, oh, you can just take five rockets and the knob, I'd go like, okay, yes, this is life. I just have all the rockets. Uh, th- I don't think there'll be six dice like the rocket boy, but it'll, be- it'll probably be more damaging with piercing one or two. Uh, the tank cameras will be crazy because if you-, you are, you will always, if you're a true orc player, you will detonate in every combat. Every first combat, you will detonate your tank hammers, no matter who you're up against. Ratlings detonate. Uh, <laughs> plasma plasma sites de- detonate. You know, just like tome scale detonate. It's just like you just run in. Yeah, I mean, the, the article does say each orc can be built in two or three ways for range of specialists and weapons. So basically, there's like the fighters, and then the specialists, and then the range version and the melee version. So. Each of them, I mean, it sounds like a cool box. If they're going to do 10 orcs, but you can build six of them for your team and select out of the squad, that could be a nice way to add some value in the box because I don't think any orc squads are just six models, right? As far in as like I big know, 40k. No. Yeah. So, like, if they're going to map over, I would expect that it's going to be whatever would count as like a full squad in 40k as the back setting. So, it might be that you get 10 orcs in the box and in 40k that's what you get or it could be one of the newer kind of more elite ish areas where you get three models to build a squad and you can go up to six so it just kind of depends very curious to see how this box because this box is kind of going to set the tone for how the next couple releases are going to look like you know do we know this the base sizes on those guys 40 mils on the uh knob 32 on the others that makes me think that gives me hope that maybe it is 10 of these guys in a box I'm kind of hoping that the Rattlings are also on 25s. Uh, you can't I think possibly be on 28s, right? I'd be shocked someone if they were not on 25s. Some on 28, uh, some on 25, uh, 32. Like the big, like the thing is, I was saying, like if this stupid anti tank rifle is as damaging, if you're on a vantage point, because the recoil should be so damaging, if you fire it, you f- you fly off the vantage point and die. <laughs> From the recoil, he just gets yeet- yeeted off the battle v- battlefield because it's like it's big, supposed to be a. The big thought is a las gun though. It's not going to have recoil. Yeah, but they've overcharged it. They've overcharged it with like a huge tank 
uh, pack. So it doesn't I'm mean like, it might like, explode. It doesn't mean that it's got to be yeah, like a large. Yeet off. Yeet off. It's just like bang, and the and the, the rattling's gone. Right, like both operatives disappear. Mutual dis- mutually assured destruction. That would be hilarious. You know, it's just like. Yeah, I will say that you know one of the fun quirks about Kill Team's line of sight rules is sometimes you can't actually see things, and if the rattlings are as small as everyone perceives rattlings to be, there's going to be a non-zero number of games where you try to get a shot on someone you physically cannot see over like a Volcus wall, and if that is the case, that'll be some true peak comedy of people thinking like, "Oh, this team's going to be so good," and like I literally cannot see over the walls and barricades I've placed in front of my way. What am I supposed to do? And like it turns off the ability to dash. Because the dash requires you to not be visible. I know there's a lot of different teams that we're all pretty excited for. John, you know, you mentioned that you've been playing a lot of Legionary. Can you walk us through maybe some of the coolest combos you've come up with in your testing? Well, I was actually doing a lot of original practice with Corsairs. Then I think the Elite matchup was originally okay. Uh, then then I ran into Inquisition. I was like, this, this doesn't work. Uh, but with uh, Legionary... It's it's still weird because the team is so super flexible. It's just I'm not used to having this flexibility before, not just with like being able to select marks, but you can do different operatives for different things. I'm finding use for the warriors, uh, like the butchers, corn butchers really good into other elites because when you pop the corn ploy, he goes to five eight. Uh, no, six eight brute uh, six eight, so he just murders elites. Although every time I've used him, he has only only rolled one or two hits. Absolutely depressing. He actually gets more use out of his stupid knife once again. Like, oh, trusty, reliable, busting out the malefic blade for the for the stupid it butcher. Five attacks to get through this model. Because the butcher lost all his rerolls, didn't he? Yes, and he went he went up to five attacks at the cost of like learning how to hit. Uh, but he's he does punch into elites really hard. But I'm finding a lot of fun with the uh, Shrive talent because I loved the Grizzly Mark before, but never could use it at turning point one because I had to get into position to seal points. Now I can just set up, like deploy that. Everyone like, oh, what, what are you deploying? It's like it's the grizzly mark. Oh, you're you're just deploying on the edge of the objective. What is? It? It's a free inch bubble. Uh, you're plus one to do mission actions, and uh, you're minus one APL to control it. It's like, oh, I can't steal that point now. It's like, yeah, I know, it's great, isn't it? And everyone just like even messes up other elites. Um, the sorcerer just running around with Zinch all the time, zapping people to heal and then charging to heal. Uh, it's just such a flexible team that I'm still learning. Uh, and I've played like so many games with them, but it's just I'm learning stuff the more I play with them, which is really cool, even though like, I'm building more operatives. So I'm building a flamer because I found some nice usage with the Nurgle gunner flamer because uh, the Nurgle tactical ploy gives you piercing if you're within free. So if you're like, if you're into hordes and you pop that reposition and dash, shoot, hit three targets within free, you've got. Four dice, hitting on twos, free free, piercing one. So that would actually murder all of them. And then on Gallo Dark, it's lethal five up. Wow. And there's new stuff like that. Yeah. Not even just on Gallo Dark, on in on open too, because Volcus yeah. is the new version of open. You know, if someone's trying to cluster around one of those strongholds and you just alley oop inside the box and spook them with your flamer <laughs> as yeah, they go off a little. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you get like tons of flex from that, and then obviously Zinch operatives going like, oh yeah. I can spare like what I did today with my Zinch Sorcerer. Spent a uh, CP, dashed, repositioned, opened the door, fireballed the commando uh, bomb squig, blew him to squig Haller, and then my opponent was like, "Okay, next turning point, I'll be able to get him to shoot." So I'll move, reposition, and dash uh, my bomb, uh, my rocket, and then I was like, "Cool, I'm gonna counteract and drop the smoke." And like he was just oh, because the. One thing I've learned with counteracting, the fact you can do unique actions on it makes it crazy, especially with Nemesis Claw, because then you can do like your leader charge fight, unique act, uh, counteract to generate a command point. But when you know you're in positions where you've got a guaranteed counteract, you effectively have an extra action. Uh, and what you can do like is what I did today, charge the sorcerer from Warp Govern. He only got one hit, parried him out, um, left him on two wounds because I could have killed him. And then I waited till my opponent had to count, like, had to activate his other sorcerers to get into position. Then, before he activated his last operative, counteracted and killed him. So it's just like all, like, it's just so flexible in a nice way, excluding all the other broken stuff they can do. Yeah, I think the new counteract phase has basically given new life to any team that was getting outnumbered by the hordes. So the days of playing a horde team and just assuming that you're going to be safe and getting a bunch of free action economy is now gone. 
So if you're going to be a Horde player, you're playing Vet Guard, Pathfinder, Inquisition Agents, you're going to be way more cognizant of when you're going to allow your opponent any freedom and, you know, whether or not chucking a dude into to hug an Astarte is actually a good idea because they can just look at you with disdain and push your face in. Yeah, you definitely have to keep your space from elites if you're going to play, like, you know, the the medium and the hordy teams. Yeah. Because it's not to say that Meltas still don't crack an elite, but with 14 wounds across the board, the number of elites that you're going to reliably crack, even with something like Relentless for something like Vetguard, where you do combined arms, you take a shot, and then suddenly your Melta is just re-rolling everything, even those things are not guaranteed to kill an elite. Although nowadays, you know, it might be a, a risk worth taking. You know, sending two dudes in to kill one Astarte is probably worthwhile at the last two activations of a turn, perhaps. Any other big combos that you mentioned, John? I know that you mentioned that you were playing Legionary. You said that you were practicing with the Corsairs up front. And I know we talked about how we're not triple shooting with the one of the few operas that can just naturally do it. The Corsair Voids card, Starstorm Duelist, who could dash into position, then pull out his normal gun, and then say that he's also going to pull out two more guns because those now ignore the action economy restrictions. What other cool things have you been finding out? I know when we played, there were a lot of door shenanigans, or I played it and there were a lot of door shenanigans with elites. Have you found the door shenanigans on Volkus to be useful for Corsair, Corsair Voids card? Yeah, because they always reposition and dash 10 inches, so they're very hard to pin down. Uh, so you can get a lot of usage out of that. But it's mainly abusing stuff like uh, Warding Shield, so you get a super old Just to Scratch. So it means... Before, when you're Kurnight Hunter or Konathi, the person with two power weapons, before they couldn't really threaten elites because they would die in two hits. But all of a sudden, <laughs> when you just tank any hit, um, it's kind of wild because he could just parry you out or just like murder you and just like, even if he trades and almost injures a Marine when dying, that's a fair trade because of how much that's worth to you. And then it was getting around the warp fold because you can still do crazy stuff with the warp fold. Just there's not as much because you can't like, if you've already repositioned or charged, you can't do that again. Um, it's actually Corsairs are very safe to play. And then I found the most success from Confirmed Kill because it's the most broken tack up in my opinion. But when you pop their uh, one of their firefight uh, strategy ploys that gives them balanced if you're on their markers, the, the messed up thing is if you kill like, there's an interesting thing. If you hit someone in a blast, the first one you kill will drop a confirmed kill counter. So you put that within range of control range of the enemy optics, and now you get balance. And then if you like, so you can actually give yourself balance during a balance sequence, which is hilarious. I don't think that works, but it, I it accept the current you, word, dude. Yeah. I, like, well, because the thing is, all blasts happen simultaneously, and then you check after that. That should be how it works, because that's how medics work, or at least that's how they used to work. I haven't actually looked oh, at the medic oh, wordings medics enough. Medics have changed. Medics have changed, because now they can use their medkit action during uh, after they've revived someone, but it doesn't have to. It can't be the same target. So now medics. You no, know, I was talking about the the specific res windows. Yeah. So the big the big thing on blast and where the action items actually pop out for confirmed kill, it should be at the end of the blasting sequence, unless blast was hit with a rewording change so massive as to not make that true. Yeah, so so Travis is saying you would resolve the blast attack against everyone and if like you after you roll the dice someone dies, you still would place the confirm kill after all of the dice for all of the targets happen. Um I definitely see the argument for that. I definitely see the argument for the way that John is saying it as well. Can you roll a crit? Um what do you think uh listeners? Let us know in the Discord and the comments. Yeah, I would expect that it's still one big chunk of actions that has to be finished and then you get to go do the extra stuff. But we'll see. That's definitely a thing that you can ask your TOs. And as always, as much as the Internet might have something or another for an for a discussion point, your local TO is going to be the final say, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how good your TOs are. So and if you feel like you have a strong opinion, you don't like your local TO, you can always try your best to start another scene and be you, the change. Something that we are very big proponents of as individual TOs and community organizers for this game that we're super, super into. Travis, what team are you going to play? I have been noodling around with a couple of teams. I've got like Firetech Circle that I was messing around with. I really want to play Pathfinders, not 
not, not that I think that they are particularly good, but they've got some interesting strengths. And one of the big changes in this edition that we didn't really have in the last edition was that all the drones kind of feel like they have something of interest. You know, the grav drone was a thing that was taken as a meme before, but now it is kind of like another barbed wire. You know, if you put a, a grav drone and two barricades on a flank, it actually can slow down your opponent who's a melee monster trying to charge you. So that's really interesting. The fact that now our pulse accelerators are one of the few things and get our pathfinders to actually output reliable damage. Also pretty interesting. Lethal five and severe. It's a pretty good combo of words when your normal Shazla's never hit anything past a four up now. And combined with the new accurate rule, it means that if you are firing a pathfinder pulse rifle next to a pulse accelerator drone and you've got bonded on, you're able to output okay number of shots that can reliably hurt some stuff. Whether or not you can reliably crack Astartes, especially Nurgle Astartes would be the big one, remains to be seen. But I do want to take them out for a spin as someone who's been playing them for so long. The new rules leave a little bit to be desired with, you know, maybe the old way of playing, going loud, flipping all of your operatives onto engage, just raining a wall of deletion onto your opponents, kind of going away. There's definitely still some interesting plays left to be done. I think a worthy causes revamp means that now if you can get two operatives onto that central objective for turning point two, you can just basically guarantee that you're always going to start with the middle objective and your own objective without too much fuss. And if you play a more concealed plan, you can pop Kaoyan and get free marker light actions for all of turn two on concealed operatives. So you've got your two silent guns. You've got enough dudes who have scary guns that do four or five damage and you can just run around and mess around with points. If you can make sure at the end of turn you have enough APL on the middle objective, you can win two turns in a row, and that technically is enough for you to have a winning chance at the game. And if that means that you can just blow people up with confirm kill and score the the critical op, maybe that's enough for them to be viable. It's hard for me to know without playing, and I just haven't quite gotten a chance to play. Yeah, so the games that you did play... And like, so, you, did you play any with Pathfinders or not yet? I haven't played with Pathfinders yet. I am looking forward to trying to do it this Thursday. So I'm excited because I think they look fun. You know, outside of the drones getting a couple upgrades, the drone controller did get a pretty beefy change in that now he can ca- cause a drone to do an action again, which means that you can just unleash a veritable hail of pulse fire between your gun drone and your recon drone and just output you know just truly an absurd number of shots downrange in a given activation so stuff like that i'm looking forward to whether or not it's actually good in the face of the new astartes threats i'm not convinced but that doesn't mean that i don't want to try it and i think that's one of like my big push for this edition is so many things are different that reading a tier list doesn't really do that much because so much is in the air that maybe Astartes in tournament play still have some issues. I doubt it, but it's still possible. Well, have you not heard of the Pathfinder build where it's one Shazla and uh, I think it's, 11 It's Shazlas. seven pair. It's like all GA2 Shazlas so that you can run yeah, around, yeah. you know, drop one marker light and take a shot. Like, I've heard about that. I can't imagine it's very good, but maybe against Astartes it could be kind of cute. Yeah, definitely up in the air. Uh, but when it comes to the, the teams that you have played, what is your favorite? I think there's definitely some really interesting, not quite elites threat in higher tech circle. I think the idea of having multiple layers of magnified lines means that you kind of get a little bit of the Brood Brothers action where each of your operatives can originate a shot that they weren't allowed to before. And having an immortal Despotech you know, be able to spend their activation to charge, count as three APL on an objective, score that objective away from, you know, a pair of dudes or a single Astartes, you know, sitting on a point because he has an APL buff. Those are kind of neat. And then being able to then have your your Technomancer or whoever shoot through that model where they couldn't, they weren't allowed to before, and then also shoot on their own in another line means that in a couple of activations, you can output a truly absurd number of dice with rerolls. Like ceaseless plus balance means that hitting on threes, you kind of just have relentless in a lot of situations. Like your so, there's definitely can command people to shoot as well to add one more shot into his activation. 
Well, no, because your cryptic can do the magnify action with one of your equipment through any of your non plasma site operatives. So you can have an immortal charge into an opponent, count as three APL, steal it from a two APL operative. So that can be his entire activation. And then you can have the leader shoot through that model and then also command that model to take their normal shot. And depending on how you sequence everything, you can also, if you're using a Technomancer, augment the weapon of yourself and then blow someone up and then tell the immortal now to fire with their four attacks on threes, four, five, crack grenade, or a Tesla carbine if you're on one of the Volcus strongholds. So there's like some really insane lines that you kind of could do before, but now you have more options to do it. And because now there's only three objectives, you as a Necron player feel way less constrained by the boards because when you were playing six objectives there was just only so many things you can do so we got a bunch of free apl actions in response so now that we've pulled back on the number of objectives you have to touch on higher tech circle they've been given one ap actions as a cost again so i think there's definitely some cool stuff in there you know you've got pretty tanky chassis the new reanimation drone can just look at a dude within six inches of him, spend two action points and just pull him back up. And that's very powerful, obviously. So I'm pretty excited. I think there's a lot of fun noodle stuff and the three different options for the higher tech circle all feel like pretty valid options. The Technomancer lets the Apprentic also get to do some cool stuff where now the Apprentic can enchant someone else after you've used the first shot already to go do something else, which is which is cool. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for the hyper complex teams, obviously. So I'm not really looking at stuff like Vetguard or Crute at the moment. I just want to play something where I get a million spells or a million weird things and I can just poke poke the game until I see what I actually like. Alrighty. You got any big tournaments coming up, John? You know, obviously New York Open coming up pretty soon. I'm actually in two weeks. I'm at uh, Warhammer World for the first event for the new edition of Kill Team. So it's a doubles event. So me and three other friends are playing. Uh, I think we've locked Ooh, in a doubles team. event. You uh, guys have your... Quadruples event. Quadruples oh, event. so it's like a team tournament at, at Warhammer World? Yeah, with the new edition. So it, each board has two Volcus, one uh, Beta Decima, one Galodark. Uh, after playing Beta Decima today, I would like to say I was completely wrong. Beta Decima is still not fit for purpose um, because... The uh, Eliminator from the Angels of Death kill team just breaks it, and I, I, I'm i wrong. I'm sorry people said, said I was crazy. They were right. Uh, I think Beta Decimal works if you're doing like short ways, like long ways deployment. If you're doing short ways where it's like uh, a hot dog. Yeah, I've actually... Wait, so you're saying that the 6-inch deployment box or the 4-inch deployment box is better? The 3-inch deployment Beta box, Decima. yeah. Yeah, I think I've kind of had the same opinion, even on Volcus. I think on Volcus, those six inch deployment box yeah, kind of constrain wins. the amount of space you're actually playing. Whereas on the three inch deployments, you get a lot more play space and things don't feel as tight. Yeah, but it, it, that's the first big event because um, I think it's sold out before uh, the new edition was announced. Now it's worked for the new edition. Um, so it's like. My friends are a bit kind of like, we should play to win. I'm like, come on, guys, just play for fun. And I was just like, pick the teams you want. And then they were like, okay, fine. I want to pick this team. I was like, maybe not that team. Try, try something else. But one of them wanted to play Pathfinders. I was like, no, come on. Don't, don't do this to yourself. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Pathfinders are a perfectly valid team. Come with, on, Travis. Uh, more, come on, Travis. We, no, we, we look, can deny, Tom's, but we know the A Tom's truth. buff drone controller Pathfinder who can control all three drones simultaneously. That's a new possibility we weren't allowed in the past. <laughs> If 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 the gun drone could activate, let's say eleven times, I would agree with you, Travis. But it, it cannot. It can, you can't have eleven gun drones. Um, but it, no, that should be fun. And then the, the craziest thing is, so I finish work on the Friday, then I'm uh, driving Saturday morning to Warhammer World, doing their quadruples event the Saturday Sunday. Then I'm driving back, and then I have to get ready to fly because the next day I'm flying to New York <laughs> for the New York Open. Uh, so I have two six round big kill team events back to back. And then I think I have two more tournaments after that than I have Worlds. I have for, anyone, for anyone coming to the New York Open, we're all going to be there, you know? Can you roll a crit and both halves of Just Another Kill Team podcast. Yeah, that'll be my first time in New York as well. So pretty excited about that. Yeah, New York is super fun. You got to take the subway to get to the venue and that'll be a fun trip all on its own. Your cat's deli, bro. Trust me. Uh, but uh, unless you're a monster like me, just get a half sandwich. Like, <laughs> 
Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, Beta Decima not fixed. We'll have a little bit of it at the New York Open. So we're going to we're going to find out in real time with everybody else how much everybody likes or dislikes Beta Decima. Along with angels having... of death, you will love Beta Decima. I'm just if you're an angels of death player, you're like it's the best kill zone. They should bring it back for sure. Good news for me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Auspexes are great on Beta Decima because you're just like, oh, I see a dude through that wall. <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't had an event where it's one leader and then the rest of your kill team are warriors. That would be great. That's because we're we're trying <laughs> not to sanity wash the legionary warrior players into <laughs> being stuck on warriors forever. I was thinking that would be a fun way to have like the version of a compendium tournament now, but the legionary warrior spam just feels kind of gross <laughs> in that <laughs> setting. Extremely S tier. Like honestly, yeah. the legionary warrior spam I feel like is like fully competitively viable. Because you is, just like, you take a bolt yeah. gun and your five attack knives, and then you start a zinch, and you've got your crazy, like, punishing, severe, rending bolt gun, and where you can just, like, outshoot anyone, and it comes from anywhere. And then you're like, you know what? Uh, I sure would like being an assault intercessor now. And then you just switch to Mark of Corn, and you're like, you know what? That's not good enough. Let's make the opponent fight as though they're injured, even when they're not. And it's just like, you can have your cake and you can eat it too and like they really are just the legion of excess uh they they've got it all i don't know jason are you sure you want to play angels of death at the new york open because warrior spam would be kind of hot it would be and it would be right on brand with like all the kind of nonsense we talk about uh, it's like uh <laughs> i do think uh one of my changes would be to legionaries either each warrior can change their mark once per game or once per turning point. One operative can do it. Like, I think yeah. The f- All I the think other the warriors are just, just once go. per turning point, they do the thing. So just yeah. do that to the legionary. Or once per game. Once per game would be because you still have the turn where they all start <laughs> and then they just turn into Zeech and just merge it. Instead of it's yeah. like, today I'm a corn warrior. I've done my corn stuff. Now I'm back being Nurgle. I want to get there. I'm Slanesh. It's great. So dumb. I say, like, they can all change as many times as they want, but you can only change one mark per turn. That would be my fix. It does that's, mirror that's what how, like, do. Yeah, and that's, like, how Vanguard works for Phobos. Um, like, kind of the reason I'm, Obviously like... how most of the warrior buffs have been worded. It's, like, one warrior turn can do the cool thing. Not every single warrior is going to do all of the cool things. So it is kind of interesting that legionary warriors do get to basically say, well, if you take five of them, you'll get five switches a turn. Good luck. Uh, and also, if you do that, get a little like either use D4s and then have a code that's like this number is this and then trail all your warriors with a D4 or just get a bunch of little like chaos icons and then set them next to them because it's going to be a mess to keep track of all that. Yeah, I actually want to. That's actually a cute, you know, final note before the end of the week's chat are there any teams that you're worried about uh tracking issues i know in the past we all use a bunch of little little rubber bands at least that's what we were using and now we got tokens are there any teams that uh you're interested you're you think don't have tracking issues because obviously legionary warriors have a ton of them oh i use uh for my i bought chaos mark so i have enough chaos marks for every operative so uh when people play me they actually go oh wow it's really easy to tell which operative is which because i've got a chaos mark showing either slanesh the each corn or Nurgle because no one runs undivided because undivided is not good because the other mark is just way better. The thing um, is, I, undivided is insanely good, but the rest are just insanely better. Yeah, yeah, right. Wow. It's, it's the future. <laughs> Anyways, continue. Uh, no, but I find those those were on Etsy and they're like twenty mil markers. So the cool thing is they can actually double up when you want to like use them for twenty mil markers as well, like for you know grizzly mark and other stuff. Uh, so that's been really helpful. I'm trying to think of other kill teams. I think it's just no- Legionary where you need, I think you would need a physical item showing what mark they have. Even if it's just like something saying like Mark of Zinch or like Zinch Nurgle Corn, uh, especially with Warriors. Because when you, it's so much fun when you just go like, you remove their counter and change their mark to Corn. Then you activate again next turning point, and then you change it to Zinch. It's like, that just makes it clear. I don't think any other teams have that problem. Uh, oh, Oh yeah, Hank and Jaegers. Sorry, I completely forgot. Hank and Jaegers have that problem. They need markers. Like I think Hank and Jaegers, because they've updated the box, so you now get two blank and three live grenades instead of all of them being live. I think you genuinely need the Halfkin token sheet, the Hank and Jaeger token sheet to play them. Yeah, we're we're in for a whole new set of uh, tracking issues as the new edition hits. 
whether or not it's worth the extra six dollars to buy the new boxes with those token sheets that's up to you listeners are the tokens only in the kill team boxes? Yeah, the new kill team boxes come with token sheets, but not the cards. The cards are a one-time print. They're like thirty-three fifty. So whether or not that's worth it, kind of up to you. Kind of nice to have, but I think I've seen people on Reddit say that you can just print off the PDFs that come with the app, and they oh, already yeah. come tarot card size, which is nice. Uh, shout out to Brood Brother players who have, if you didn't buy Termination, s- sucks to be you. <laughs> so expensive yeah because now the box doesn't include any of the hero characters and all of those hero characters uh i don't know hopefully uh, there's not an easy solution to that because even if they sell all the characters as another box it's going to cost as much as the rest of the kill team but i mean i guess a lot of other kill teams are ideally a two kill team kill team but like brood brothers can you even play it with just what's in that box you could you would just be the most um Player, you would be the most sporting player in the world. You would get all the sporting votes. Everyone would be happy. They'd be like, look, this 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 Brood Brother player only had 10 operatives. It's just like, didn't do anything. But so it was it's kind great. of like the new Vet Guard. Like, no one plays Vet Guard with 10 models. Well, yeah, I had a lot of people complaining on my review. They were like, they removed the airstrikes. I was having a lot of success with 10 Guardsmen and airstrikes. I was like, okay, I like to live in crazy land too. Oh, people said yeah. that? Jeez. Yes, exactly. Someone was like, I'm really upset they removed overcharged las guns because I wanted to go hot with my las guns. I was like, if you went hot with your normal las guns, there's a, you have like a one in six chance of going down to two wounds because you fired a las gun. Is that really what you want to be? How would that be viable? Well, John, we have ceaseless and we roll ones, so we're never going to hit ones anyways. <laughs> they got balanced now. They got balanced. So. Yeah. Got saturated. Yeah. I think I'm excited to see where things go. We'll see. You know, we'll be on the stat show for our Patreon listeners, you know, very soon looking at what came this weekend. Maybe people were already playing on October, October 5th for the new edition. Anyways, John, let our listeners know where they can find you. If they don't already know, you've been dropping some banger guides for every single kill team this edition so far. Will it ever end? Uh, I hope it will because I'm I'm I I need to sleep. I am currently editing uh, them as we speak. Uh, my life is like pain. Uh, it's great. Uh, I'm on Can You Roll a Crit. You can find me on Can You Roll a Crit uh, on Can You Roll a Crit as well as if you search Can You Roll a Crit. So it's Can You Roll a Crit. Um, eventually the guides will stop and I will be free. Uh, but currently I am only halfway through and uh, my life is pain. <laughs> Amusingly, when I was trying to look up one of your map packs uh, a couple days ago that you released, um, I googled "Can you roll a crit?" Um, the third edition map packs, and then an AI thing was like, "Yes, you can roll a crit on this map." And I was like, <laughs> "AI, you're really uh, missing the point here, bud." Oh yeah, you can. Find, I've I've made map pack for Octarius, um, so you can play that if, if if you don't have focus. Yeah, third edition for Octarius. Yeah. I made it quite safe. I've seen a variation where all the objectives were in the open, and I was like, no, I like that. Yeah. Anyways, listeners, thanks for hanging out and uh, chatting or listening to us chat about the new edition and some of the stuff that we're excited about. Thanks for listening until the end.